Good morning, everyone. Um, first, I'm sorry for the delay. There was miscommunication with some of the invitees about the time, 9 or 9.30, so we took the half measure of 9.15, starting. So I'd like to welcome you all, uh, Mr. Sean Bichard, Sean Bichard, Deputy Director of uh, UNDP country, uh, Mr. Sada Arnaud, the Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management Lead in the World Bank, Mr. Bahakim Kabakia, Climate Change Advisor to the Minister of Environment and representing him today, and uh, colleagues, excellencies, friends. Uh, it gives us a great pleasure today to welcome you at the uh, consultation meeting for the flagship report, Adaptation to a Climate Change to a changing climate in the Arab world, which is being prepared uh, by the League, of State, the League of Arab States and the World Bank. We at the Climate Change and Environment in the Arab World Program at the Hassan Paris Institute take great pride in being hosts and co-hosts, if you will, to this event. And we would like uh, this to be, for you to feel that this is your second home when it comes to issues related to climate change. We have a very rich program today, so I will not talk too long, just this and make sure that we make, they make the best of this opportunity to feed into this report and give in good advice and uh, good recommendations so that we can set things right from the get-go rather than whine about it later. So this is our chance to feed into the report and I hope we all take it. Thank you. Mr. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nadim, distinguished um, guests, ladies and gentlemen, so I'll I feel a little bit like I'm on a time show with this uh, microphone, so please uh, bear with me. But um, it's uh, my great pleasure to, to be here to participate in this important uh, event today on behalf of uh, UNDP, but also just as one of the many actors in, in responding to the issues that, that we'll discuss today. Um, it's no secret, though, uh, despite the existence of a few fringe uh, skeptics and despite uh, some very considerable global actions uh, to, to mitigate the contributing factors, um, climate change remains uh, probably the most significant uh, challenge to both the environment but also to, to human development uh, globally. And uh, Lebanon is obviously no, no exception, especially uh, considering the uh, uh, context of, of limited resources and considering the very um, significant potential impact of, of climate change on Lebanon, given the uh, specificity of uh, the, the country characteristics. Um, so the challenges are great, but I think uh, you know, looking around the room and, and seeing all of the, the various uh, organizations represented here, all the layers, the, from, from government, national, to, to local, to international organizations, civil society, the private sector. Um, it's, uh, you know, we really have, uh, each of us together, our competitive advantages um, combined really can make a change, so that's quite uh, uh, encouraging. UNDP, for our part, has been an active player in, in addressing climate change since the early uh, 1990s. Um, we've mobilized largely uh, through the Global Environment Facility, approximately some uh, $2 billion to respond uh, to these issues in over 100 countries worldwide. Um, in Lebanon, we began working with the Ministry of uh, Environment uh, as far back uh, as 1997 on uh, issues related to climate change, um, including the development, supporting the development of the first national communication uh, the report at that time uh, was very much exploratory in, in nature and looked mostly at the sources of, of climate change uh, factors. Um, the second national communication was launched last year, took another step further, um, looked more at the vulnerabilities related to climate change in, in Lebanon, um, but didn't have the, really the scope to go uh, into the depth um, that we probably would have liked, and I think that that's uh, the, the, the flagship uh, publication that, that, that we're um, uh, discussing here today uh, contributes uh, to this journey in looking at, at the issues um, related to adapting to, to climate change across all sectors, and especially the most vulnerable uh, ones uh, for this part of the world, and, and Lebanon included, 
water, agriculture, um, coastal zones, just to name a few. Um, but of course, it's also it's very important, and we will be speaking a lot about the actions taking place on, on the ground. Uh, UNDP, um, along with many others, has, has uh, been uh, doing this uh, uh, very active on the ground in terms of uh, looking at better water management practices, for example. Um, the Lebanese Center for Water Management and Conservation was established uh, last year at the Ministry of Energy and, and Water to help strengthen efforts uh, in responding to the issue. Um, if I could just sort of use one illustration to, to look at the types of effective partnerships here, we can look at the uh, at Balbek, a particularly flood prone region, um, where if I, I have, a, have the numbers correct, it's, uh, they estimate something like two and a half million dollars in economic damages per every flood event. And uh, I'm not sure if it's anecdotally, but if, if I have it correct, the, what, what is so concerning is the incidence of, of the flood events experienced there are increasing so, so rapidly, whereas uh, perhaps in the past it was once every 10 years, uh, and now it's practically an annual uh, event. So as a result, we've been engaged in a uh, large infrastructural project um, on flood risk management in, in Baalbek since 2008 in cooperation with the Ministry of Agriculture to help local people protect themselves from the damages of flooding. Uh, this particular project is funded uh, by the government of Spain through the Lebanon Recovery Fund. And through these efforts, we hope to, uh, with an investment of something around six and a half million dollars, uh, not only recoup uh, that investment in economic terms within a matter of just a few years, uh, but of course make uh, major impacts in terms of mitigating uh, human misery uh, that results from, from uh, flood events. In addition, um, the two uh, projects also work on smaller local level uh, activities, one of which actually is in coordination with the uh, Community Neighborhood Program at ADB, that uh, we're proud to, to partner with, uh, to help implement water savings and, and irrigation efficiency uh, activities. So I think um, we'll hear a lot more about these uh, later in the day. I think this is a great example of really uh, completing the, the, the full uh, nexus from the policy level uh, to the local and, and community um, level. We hope to uh, expand these types of efforts through uh, supporting the uh, development of the Ministry of Environment uh, Climate Change Unit uh, and as well ensure that they are, are strengthening their partnership with the Disaster uh, Risk Reduction uh, Unit that we support also at the uh, Prime Minister's office. So I think in, in closing, it's certainly no secret, but uh, it's, it's uh, now more than ever crucial for countries such as Lebanon to ensure uh, that the development agendas and environment uh, agendas and uh, mitigation and adaptation both take and, and play a core uh, central role. Um, putting together supporting climate resilient development plans uh, is uh, absolutely necessary to help both uh, our economies and our communities thrive in a time of, of great certainty. And I guess, really, rather we could say a time of great um, uh, uncertainty, but certainty that climate change impacts will happen. We don't know when, we don't know where, but we do know that they will happen, and we have to be prepared. Thank you very much. Is there some down note, please? Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to start by mentioning that the World Bank is extremely delighted to work with the Minister of Environment in Lebanon. I would like to commend the level of commitment and engagement witnessed by His Excellency the Minister of Environment, the staff of the Minister of Environment, and the Government of Lebanon. Our special thanks go also to Isam Fares Institute and UNDP for their advocacy role and their help in organizing this event. We, however, regret that the League of Arab States could not be present here today, but has reiterated its full support to this exercise. We welcome today all the national stakeholders present with us and look forward to their active contribution and valuable inputs during today's debate. Uh, colleagues, it's now certain that the Arab world is not only witnessing regime change, but also climate change. Climate change has already become apparent, marked by increased temperature and more rapid precipitation, as we have all noticed in our world. 
Warming in the Arab region is about 50% higher than the global mean warming. Intense precipitation is leading to flooding and slow erosion in different countries like Yemen, Algeria. In Syria, years of drought are contributing to a lot of rural to urban migration. We have witnessed that. And as mentioned by the colleague from UNDP Lebanon has witnessed recently increased precipitation, flooding, and uh, soil erosion. It's worth noting also that social and political stress factors are compounding the impact of climate change. We cannot dissociate that from that aspect. Let me list some of them, which is not a comprehensive list, unfortunately. We all know the chronic poverty we face, increasing population, weak institutions and physical infrastructure, low access to technology and information, political and social instability, lack of political commitments, access to resources and management capabilities, and high literacy rates and lack of skills. So this is compounding the climate change issues we're facing. If we look at the human uh, geography profile of the Arab world, we all recognize that throughout the history, the Arab world witnessed the development of big cities, metropolis, and export-oriented economies, which subsequently encouraged coastal agglomeration. The region has experienced rapid urbanization with an average growth rate of 2.1%, with 65% increase in the urban population corresponding to over 130 million additional urban inhabitants by 2030. Also, the region witnessed a growing urbanization of poverty with the proliferation of slums and informal settlements. It's estimated that 20 to 40% of urban residents in the MENA region live in slums, mostly located in high-risk rural areas. Also, unfortunately, the MENA region has a legacy of natural disasters. Uh, we, the, the region has faced 100, almost 120 disasters in the last five years, with an average economic cost of 1 billion American dollars per year. Coastal cities are among the largest and most vulnerable urban agglomerations and are home to over 60 million, reaching 100 million by 2030. Uh, Higher intensity and frequency of uh, hot days are increasing the demand for energy and impacting the power generation. We're witnessing increase in temperature, as we said, sea, sea level rise uh, has been witnessed in Kuwait, Qatar, Libya, Tunisia, UAE, and Egypt also. In addition, storm surges are presenting huge threats to buildings and infrastructure in the region, to transportation system, and infrastructure. Going forward, Threats to both food and water security in the Arab world are clear evidence that the do-nothing scenario is no longer an option. However, despite the availability of scientific data uh, on the global impact of climate change, and despite the fact that the Arab world is at a stage where adaptation to climate change is less painful and less costly than mitigation, countries of the Middle East have not yet matched this by political will, will to act early and decisively enough. Virtually no work has been carried out to make the Arab countries prepared for climate change. No concerted data gathering and research efforts could be traced effectively regarding the impacts of climate change on health, infrastructure, biodiversity, tourism, water and food production. The economic impact seems to be totally ignored and reliable records on climate patterns in the region barely exist as reported in 2009 by the Arab Forum for Environment and Development. Going forward, building, res uh, building resilient cities, reducing emissions and sharing knowledge are at the core of the World Bank strategy. The World Bank is constantly seeking partnership with governments in the region, the civil society, the donor community, and UN agencies with the aim to raise awareness, share knowledge, and provide soft financing for adaptation to climate change. As a result, the World Bank has adopted a programmatic approach that has three phases, basically. Phase one, which is the subject of today's meeting and consultation, is the preparation of a regional flagship report that covers all of the 22 Arab countries. This timely report will address climate change in these countries and follows the 2010 World Development Report on Climate Change. Phase two, which will come subsequently, will be mainly a demand-driven 
response to government requests to prepare country-specific strategies addressing both adaptation and mitigation. So we do the region study first, then we zoom on countries based on demand-driven approach. Phase three consists of operation support that the World Bank will provide through grants, loans, and reversible technical assistance to client countries of the world. Today's workshop represents an important, inclusive, and participatory step towards validating the above strategy. And we welcome all the feedback, comments that would help us achieve a common goal for us. So allow me to wish you good luck and to thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll close this opening uh, session with uh, Mr. Bahak and Kabbalah. Thank you, Nadine. Good morning, all. Um, uh, would like to uh, um, to mention the uh, um, the honor that I have representing the Minister of Environment today and um, convey his regrets that he's not uh, he was not able to, to join us today. Um, with that, um, I, I would like to stress the importance of uh, in general climate change in, in our national agenda. Um, specifically adaptation, um, uh, being um, a developing country uh, that we do not really contribute to climate change, um, but uh, we're kind of on the other side of the, of the spectrum where we see the climate change impact in this region. The fourth assessment uh, report of the IPCC has, uh, that, was, that was out in 2007 um, did uh, confirm that climate change is an unequivocal. Um, globally, the numbers of uh, typhoons, uh, hurricanes, floods have been increasing. And as, as Sean mentioned, that you would see in, uh, in a few moments, the numbers of floods um, has been increasing in Lebanon. It is also true for the Arab world that these were not reflected in the IPCC report. This is where the importance of today's, or practically um, the World Bank Arab League, Adaptation flagship report comes in. Um, it will practically provide uh, input for the fifth IPCC assessment report. Um, it will um, summarize the available literature on the region, climate change impact on the region, identify gaps, and describe policy options. We thank World Bank, the Arab League, for initiating this mounting task and firmly believe that this report will provide information on potential climate change in our region as well as strategic guidance on the adaptation to climate change. The negotiations um, going um, under the UNF uh, C um, are quite crucial to the collective Arab, Arab region, uh, specifically in tackling climate change issues. We're aware that whatever emission reduction that is taken today, even if we stop our emission reductions globally, we would definitely have certain increase in temperature globally which makes it imperative that we need to have adaptation to climate change. From a policy maker's perspective, it's imperative um, uh, to know the broader socioeconomic implications of our future climate change uh, regime. It's clear that any, uh, uh, <clears throat> it's clear that if the primary resources are affected due to climate changes, there would be inverse socioeconomic implications that would follow. Therefore, we need to urgently develop our adaptation blueprints, share experiences in the region, exchange knowledge in order to amplify our joint efforts in combating climate change. Putting forward the evidence of ecological system alterations due to human-induced climate changes underpinned by the peer review process that judges the comprehensiveness, competence, significance, and credibility of the work, thus making it robust and trustworthy. Therefore, it is by no chance that we have partnered with the American University of Beirut and its Sound Virus Institute to bring a more um, scientific flavor to our today's consultation meeting. We're proud of such an institution that has provided two lead authors and two advisors to this report. On this note, I would like to thank the, um, the team members who worked really hard and, and, and jointly in preparing this, this meeting. Um, from the Arab League, from the World Bank, from UNDP, from IFI, and from the Ministry of the Environment. Thank you. Thank you, Bahakan. Uh, again, I would 
take after Wagner and say thank you to all those that worked very hard at making this uh, event possible to start out with and for its smooth running. As you will see, we are quite efficient. We move on directly to the uh, first session, which is an introduction to work on climate change and, change and adaptation in Lebanon. We've got three speakers, and Mr. Sada Arnaud will be chairing this session. Thank you. Welcome to the podium, uh, Mr. Shangarist, who is a project manager at the UNDP project at the Ministry of Agriculture. He will be presenting uh, Adapting to Climate Change, Reducing the Impact of Floods and Recharging Groundwater. He will be followed by Mr. Ziad Khayyad, who is a project manager at the UNDP with the Ministry of Energy and Water, who will be addressing the issue of water management and climate change adaptations, rainwater storage, groundwater recharge, and water conservation. Finally, we will close the session with Dr. Nadine Farajalla, who is the Climate Change Faculty Research Director at IFRAB, who will be presenting drought frequency and consumptive water use. So allow me to welcome all the speakers and we'll start with Mr. Shabaris. And good morning. We will present, uh, Sean, we did half my presentation so far. We're presenting a project by UNDP and the Ministry of Agriculture on uh, flood risk management in the Casa of Baal Abilhirmin. <clears throat> the project falls within the context of the National Action Plan to Combat Desertification, which was published by the Ministry of Agriculture in 2003. There is a program by UNDP at the Ministry of Agriculture called the Sustainable Land Management Program. It's made up of four projects. It's a portfolio of $8 million, and it's managed by UNDP in partnership with the Ministry of Agriculture, mainly, and other ministries in Lebanon. We have a long history of floods. The first uh, record is in 1293, there was a huge flood in Balbak, and the list continues in different regions in Lebanon. We have two types of floods, river floods and flash floods in one east. What we deal with in this project are flash floods. You can see every 10 years, there is an increase in flood frequency in Lebanon. It might be climate change, it might be natural weather changes, it might be lack of records or less records in previous history. But from what we see now in Ras Baalbar, the floods that used to happen every 10 years happen every year. The last one was on the 25th of September this year. There was a big flood in the region of Ras Baalbar. The main causes from what we have assessed from the ground is deforestation. The watershed of Ras Baalbak, Lua, Arsel, is about 350 square kilometers or more. It used to be a forest historically from records, now it's completely deforested. Urbanization and climate change. In terms of impact, there used to be a lot of loss of lives, now it's reduced. In the first flood in Baalbak, hundreds of deaths were recorded. There is loss of property for sure in terms of houses and agricultural areas. 
There is loss of livelihood because people lose their working. There is erosion of topsoil. When you see the water coming through as well, I wanted to show you a movie, but it didn't work on this uh, laptop, maybe during the coffee break. There is a lot of soil that comes from the, we did not assess yet mass transport in the flood waters, but in the village they took a cup of water, filled it with the flood water, and eight of that was soil. The rest was water. Of course, when there is overland flow, there is a reduction in groundwater in charge. The Higher Relief Council, the Higher Relief Council, assessed the cost of one damage, the direct cost, not the environmental cost or the soil erosion cost. It amounts to two and a half million dollars per flood event. You can see it on the records of the Higher Relief Commission. So it is a lot of money lost in floods. As I said, we have two types of flood in Lebanon, river floods and flash floods. Mainly the rivers of Abu Ali and Beirut have historically flooded. Flash floods happen in the area of Hermin, Ba'a, Arsal, Fekha, where the Turkmen, where it happened this summer. <coughs> this is the project. It is within the ESLM program. The budget is around $6 million. It is divided into two phases. Phase one was in the watershed of Arsal. It's 95 square kilometers, which is this area here, the missing white area. And phase two is in Rasab Albaq, which is 250 square kilometers. And this is the watershed you see here on this drawing. This is the Syrian border. Phase one has been completed. It was managed by our colleague, Dr. Hassan Mashra, present here. Now we are starting with phase two of the project. It's funded by the Spanish government through the Lebanon Recovery Fund, managed, as you said, by UNDP. And the execution of the project started in 2008 to end in 2013, uh, early 2013. In phase one, eight reservoirs were built. Eight reservoirs were built of a total of 330,000 cubic meters. These are able to collect 60% of flood water for a 50-year flood. You know that floods have a recurrence period. We have set a limit of 50 per, uh, 50%, 60% of the water for a 50-year flood. This is a decision based on engineering and economics, amount of damage, cost that we want to prevent. What was done is large reservoirs dug in soil in the watershed. These are very easy to construct. All you need is an excavator. There is no concrete work involved. Also, to prevent soil erosion and to reduce the formation of gullies, we have built walls. These are giants built in the flood streams and on contours on hills, so they reduce soil erosion coming in the areas. There are 161 walls built in the watershed of uh, Arsal. Also, one way to reduce the to reduce overland flow is to reforest the area. So accordingly, we have planted 15,000 trees, and these are being managed by the municipality of Arsal. We are experimenting with different methods of planting and we have some success instead of planting seedlings, we're planting seeds, we're using solid water to irrigate. We're trying to reduce the cost because it is expensive these days to plant trees, especially when we have to also fence them to protect them and the cost of a fence is very high. But we have a problem of overgrazing in the area where 50,000 heads mixed of sheep and goat. So anything you plant will be eaten while you plant it. <coughs> there is also a component on support to the municipality. Several trainings were done in the area for the people in Arsa, for the municipality, on floods and how to manage floods, on how to maintain the reservoir. Because when there is a flood event, there will be some erosion and there will be soil left in the bottom of the, of the reservoir. So we gave the municipality of Arsa an excavator so they can remove the uh, whatever eroded soil and keep the volume of the reservoir and do maintenance work on the walls. The idea is to reduce the flow that goes through the village. The watershed of Arsal, the water goes a bit in Arsal and then it goes down to Feka and causes a lot of <coughs> We need to reduce soil erosion and also use the flood positively to recharge groundwater. These are pictures from the last flood. <coughs> the water that is recharged, we don't have studies yet, but from ge all geological maps in Lebanon, it seems that the water that is recharged in the watersheds of the different location goes down to the Beka Valley in the, in the next to the villages. There is another option that is uh, comparable to earth reservoirs is the dams. There was a study done for us about on dams. 
But so far, the cost of storage in dams and uh, when there is concrete involved is about $6 per meter cube. For earth reservoirs, so far, our cost does not go beyond $2 per meter cube, and they're simple to most uh, Do we construct the dam or not depends on the flood frequency. The floods don't come every year. Sometimes they come on a yearly basis, on a yearly basis. sometimes they stop for 10 years. So the economics of a dam that is used later for investments in agriculture and irrigation are not there yet. This is the most recent flood. It happened on the 25th of uh, September. It hit the area of Arsel, Fekha, El Hermel with different intensities. We've assessed the intensity with the data we have because we all know that there is a lack of data and measurement in uh, Lebanon. With the data and the formulas and the assumptions we can use, the one that hit Ras Al-Balbak was a five to 10 year flood. The flood that hit Wadi Trikman was a 20 year flood. These are the pictures from the reservoir. This is the collected water. At the time of the picture, the water had dropped one meter from, its, uh, from what it is now. So the total volume collected in the reservoirs in Ras Al-Balbak was about 30 to 40,000 cubic meters. This would have gone through the village of uh, if not collected by the reservoirs. Well, if we estimate the value say, of uh, this water that has been now collected in groundwater, supposedly, not all of it, some of it is useful. This is almost equivalent to irrigating 50 hectares of land. So if you can store it and you, if you can store it in groundwater, not in the reservoirs, because these need to empty before another flood event, it can be used for irrigating 50 hectares. Okay. If the crop is wheat or barley, it can be used to irrigate, to irrigate more. It's drinking water for seven days. There is economic gain in reducing soil erosion also. This, these are the walls that have been built, the contour walls. If you can see in the picture, there is moisture that has collected behind the walls. This used to flow and go down to the caves and rivers. This moisture, soon you start seeing the green cover and growing behind the, behind the walls. The, invest, the cost of a flood, we said, is $2.5 million for one flood event. The project is $6 million in terms of total investment for phase one and phase two. The return on investment is 2.4 years. So I think it's a successful project if we, if we take it in economic terms. For phase two, we have planned 13 reservoirs. A total volume of 1.5 million cubic meters will be dug in the region of Ras Balba. It's on the floodways, it will collect water coming down to the villages. We don't have the budget to do all the watershed in terms of wall structures, so we've selected a pilot area here, which will have 104 wall structures. 3,500 trees will be planted, but this time close to the village, because we have also the problem of overgrazing in the area. Training and capacity building also for all the local stakeholders. In parallel, whenever there is a flood event, the team from the yeah, a team of five people, will go on site and try to assess the damages, the flows, the extent of uh, the flood. There is also a component of awareness and capacity building ongoing and a component of resource mobilization to cover more areas because most of the area of Albuquerque and Hermit is subject to floods at different frequencies. This is the assessment from the last flood, the regions that were hit by the September flood. We are also involved as a project also managed by NDP on disaster risk management. They cover three main types of disasters, earthquakes, forest fires, and floods. We contribute technically to this project, and now they're developing a uh, <coughs> flood, risk, sorry, flood risk map of Lebanon. So we're supporting this project technically and we partnering with them. And thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, I'll be presenting today uh, activities of UNDP and the Libby Center for Water Management and Conservation at the Ministry of uh, Energy and Water. Uh, basically, we will be looking at some of the projects we're doing activities relating to uh, water management and climate change. Basically, we're looking at rainwater storage, groundwater recharge, and water conservation. Uh, the outline today will be introducing the uh, role of the Lebanese Center for Water Management and Conservation, uh, groundwater recharge, water conservation, and rainwater storage. Just a brief introduction about the uh, Lebanese Center for Water Management and Conservation. It was established uh, based on a request of the Ministry of Energy and Water uh, early this year in January 2011 with a vision that every drop is a national treasure. Uh, our main goals uh, at the start of this project or this center, with the kick of this uh, center, is a groundwater assessment and database project, uh, support to the ministry's newly introduced national water sector strategy, uh, basically working on two uh, initiatives of this strategy, and they are awareness raising on water conservation and protection and artificial recharge of aquifers, and uh, providing technical support on the request of the ministry. Uh, the Groundwater Assessment and Database Project was funded by the uh, Republic of Italy through a 1.8 million euro grant. Uh, the idea for it came since we're lacking data, as the last national study on groundwater was done back in 1970. And since then, more than 43,000 wells have been drilled. This has led to increased seawater intrusion and to decrease in groundwater levels in many areas. Uh, the main objectives of this study are to assess the availability of groundwater data and studies, update the available groundwater data, uh, initiate a groundwater resources dedicated database, which, will, which should be available online, and it should contain all the collected data and the updated data on groundwater. And finally, update the groundwater map, which I mentioned was last done back in 1970. And, uh, on the topic of supporting the national water sector strategy, we'll be identifying sites for potential artificial recharge. Okay, so on the front of artificial recharge, okay, we don't need to do this. Okay, as per the national water sector strategy, uh, there's a need to avail additional water resources of approximately 200 cubic uh, million cubic meters per year through artificial recharge. Uh, in the groundwater study that we've, we've started uh, doing, uh, we'll be ranking sites, potential sites in the country, according to their technical characteristics for uh, artificial recharge. And we'll be looking at hydrologic structures, hydraulic characteristics of the storage aquifer, the aquifers type of available water, and through that we will have a preliminary selection of potential sites. This is already funded and this is, uh, will be part of the groundwater study that's being performed and uh, scheduled to end in 2013. Now additional funding will be required once we identify these sites to actually go and do the uh, specific testing of the sites through site characterization, physical surveys, uh, exploration borehole, uh, pumping tests, and injection tests. And then after this testing, we will uh, select pilot project sites for actually where we will be implementing artificial recharge. Okay, the second activity of the center is actually on awareness uh, raising and water of uh, water conservation. And the objective of this is to raise public awareness on the importance of water and its conservation and to promote demand side management. Again, as per the national water sector strategy, the target for uh, domestic sector is uh, a 3 liter per capita per day saving from year 2011 to uh, year 2020, which leads to more than 50 million cubic meter per year saving by 2020. And uh, for you that are familiar with the Shabruk Dam, that's equivalent to uh, six Shabruk size dams. In the irrigation sector, the target is to decrease from 9,000 to 7,000 
uh, cubic meters per hectare per year irrigation by 2035. And this is approximately around 300 million cubic meter per year saving. Again, this is equivalent to 1.5 the ground size down. Uh, the target sectors uh, for awareness raising are the domestic, touristic, agriculture, and industrial. And the instruments that uh, would be used are policy, education, and uh, the media. And recently, we, maybe you've seen it, uh, national, we've launched a national water conservation campaign in collaboration with the Spanish Embassy and the Arcold uh, Project on uh, water conservation. Uh, as part of the water conservation activities, we've also launched a, uh, a water audit in a, in a town in, in North Lebanon called Hamad. And this study is being done in collaboration with the uh, educational sector with the American University of uh, Technology. Uh, the object objectives of this study are to assess the current water usage practices in this town and how much water can be saved in the home. Uh, basically just using simple, uh, low-cost, uh, methods, uh, awareness, and water saving devices. Now, why we chose Hamad, uh, the reason for this is that Hamad in North Lebanon is one of the first towns that uh, are equipped with water meters for each house. And they've been installed since June 2009. And customers have a continuous supply of water, and we have approximately 260 customers. So we have data to compare before and after this activity. The expected results are to identify simple ways for saving water in the home, provide water efficient devices, and mainly we're talking about aerators for faucets, taps, uh, shower head flow limiters, uh, toilet tank volume displacement bags, the triggers for garden hoses, as applicable for each home. And the cost of this complete package is probably around $30 per home. Uh, and then provide a recommendation for improving the water consumption habits and finally, comparing water usage pre and post audit. And we'll be doing this for a year. We will be observing the, the data of water meters and comparing them over a, uh, a year. Uh, and this is actually the array that I'm talking about. Simple devices uh, saves around 40% of your water usage. So at the local level, the consumers will benefit by reducing their, uh, their water bills. Uh, we will uh, raise awareness on how to conserve water by habit change, implement water conservation uh, measures, and reduce wastage and, un and unnecessary use of water. At the national level, uh, th we hope that this study will provide valuable data on effectiveness of water saving devices. So this study can be extended to other areas that don't have water meters. And uh, we hope to shed some light on the local habits and effectiveness of awareness measures what works and what doesn't. The third topic, uh, or final topic of today, is rainwater storage at the household level. If we go back to, uh, to our habits and uh, of the rural communities, basically, in Lebanon, we see that uh, rural communities actually practice uh, storing water, rainwater, uh, without connecting it or without associating it with climate change habits and the need to save water. It was just in their, in their daily ritual. So dwelling units used actually to collect rainwater from rooftops of their houses and channel them into uh, underground tanks. We see that that, uh, that is a uh, concrete tank. The one there is a built underground concrete tank and this is a hand dug with stone walls another underground storage. Uh, also villages used to have open village reservoirs, uh, usually the center of activities in the village, where they used to collect rainwater for agricultural use and the use of, uh, for, their, for their herds and cattle. In the hinterland, uh, what they used to do is they used to build these stone walls so that water would collect behind them and it would infiltrate into the groundwater. So uh, rainwater storage is becoming a lost tradition, especially in the south. Many of the uh, water ponds and water collection ponds 
are being converted into, this one is being converted into a water park used for a much, uh, and other, uh, other uh, water collection ponds are being lost, such as this one, which has been converted into a playground. So we're losing this uh, traditional way of collecting rainwater. And this is really harmful in a, in a time that we're becoming more aware and aware of the effects of climate change. One of the case examples that we're working on is uh, in Mawahim village, and this is a project funded by UNDP, Coca-Cola uh, project, Every Drop Matters. It's uh, supervised by SCWMC, and uh, it's in collaboration with the American University of Beirut, Center for Civic Engagement and Community Service. And the project amount is 70,000. <coughs> So this is uh, the pond the village, in the village square, the center of activity, and it's usually used to irrigate tobacco plots all around it and for the village use. What we're hoping to do uh, through rehabilitating this pond is uh, to bring back this pond as a center so that the people can again use it to fulfill agriculture practices. Uh, so it will be as an attractive amenity and landscape for the community and this will bring pride in their, uh, in their heritage and uh, again this is to promote sustainable water resources management uh, restoring as I said local pride and traditional water conservation and raising awareness uh, on the value of within the contemporary agenda for climate change adaptation uh, the project, uh, the, the pond area is approximately 4,000 uh, meters squared with a depth that ranges between uh, 1.5 and 2 meters. Uh, Marwahi village has approximately 1,500 residents that depend on this pond mainly for their uh, agricultural practices and for some household uses. Uh, basically, we're trying to eliminate this loss through infiltration. What we're doing is rehabilitating the pond to increase its uh, water collection capacity. So we're moving from the site, uh, the accumulated debris over the years. Uh, we're strengthening the foundation walls, constructing a base slab, and rehabilitating the stone walls. Other similar projects in other areas of the country that have been done with the uh, assistance of the Ministry of Agriculture uh, are a, a water pond in Majd al -Akkar. Uh, pond in Dair al Ahmar and another pond in Dair al Ahmar. The uh, one in Majd al Akbar has been funded by <coughs> Ardo, and the one in Dair al Ahmar by the OPEC Fund, and Dair al Ahmar too <coughs> has been funded by LRF and the Spanish government. Uh, they've been excluded by UNDP, and the one in Dair al Ahmar also by Akarta and UNDP. Uh, they are at different scales. The one in Majd is for 15 farmers with 5,000 cubic meters. Uh, Dar al Ahmar 1 is 20 farmers and 6,000 cubic meters. The one in Dar al Ahmar 2 is the largest and it's uh, for 200 farmers and 30,000 cubic meters. Uh, each one has a different purpose actually. The one in Majd al Aqqar is used to uh, harvest water of Ain Tabu and the collected water is used for irrigation of approximately 15 meters. <coughs> And also, we, uh, we've introduced the drip irrigation to go along with this water pond. The one in Dar al Ahmar 1, it's the harvesting of the Yamuni spring, and the uh, collected water is used for irrigation of vegetable cultivation and apple orchids. Uh, the one in Dar al Ahmar 2, again, water is collected from the Yamuni spring. Collected water is used for irrigation of vineyards for wine production. Uh, the estimated uh, irrigated area is approximately 50 hectares, which could be increased every two years, a cycle of two years of 50 he hectares for a total of 200 hectares. Uh, this is uh, the location of the one in Majd al -Aqqar. This is the source of uh, office, and this is the uh, reservoir with the targeted parcels for irrigation. This is uh, pictures of the excavation works. And this is the reservoir filled with water. 
uh, in Daryl Ahmar. This is Daryl Ahmar 1, again, big shot of water. And this is Daryl Ahmar 2, uh, 1. And uh, along with these ponds, uh, improved efficient irrigation methods are being introduced, uh, such as drip irrigation in Najd al Akrar and in Daryl Ahmar. Thank you. <coughs> Try to be brief. We're going over time, I understand, so I'll just go as quickly as permissible. I'll talk about the project that we've done, a combined project where we looked at evapotranspiration or consumptive water use and uh, coupled with drought frequency in Lebanon. Uh, the motivation is very simple. Agriculture uses, uses about 70% of our fresh water, and we know through two different sets of studies that the temperature in this part of the world is going to be increasing. IPCC says it's up to 4 degrees Celsius. This is seconded by the Lebanon's second national communication, which also says it's about 4 degrees Celsius. Precipitation anywhere de uh, decrease from 20% to 45%, and then there's a change in relative humidity depending on the area that we're looking at, coast versus inland. Quick notes, uh, maximum temperature in Beirut over the last 125 years has not significantly changed. What has changed though is the minimum temperature which has changed very up to 3 degrees Celsius. Reasons are uh, mostly climate change, some due to heat iron defect. Precipitation in Beirut also has not really changed over the past years. That's the total. Patterns change. Similar trends have been observed in the Bekaa. I'm putting this as background information for you. Temperature on the minimum has decreased, but the maximum temperature has not significantly changed. The Bekaa temperature also, the precipitation, has also been uh, not statistically significant, uh, has not noticed significantly uh, changing the change. So what you want to do out of this is assess the impact of climate change on crop water consumptive use, and then look at the droughts that are associated with this climate change. For this, we looked at two uh, basins. One, a coastal basin, the Barsa, which is uh, just south of Tripoli, and the other one is the, Sher the Sherbin uh, basin, uh, close to where uh, Sherbin's project is. It's in the northeastern part of the country. Uh, the Barsa, uh, Wadi Barsa has anywhere between 900 and 1200 millimeters of rainfall. Temperature varies between 14 degrees and uh, 24 and a half degrees Celsius. Its land use is distributed, mainly agricultural, uh, most of which is uh, olive, olive groves. So you expect that in, in, in Kura. And the other one, the Sherbin uh, Basin, is quite different. 
rainfall ranges between 200, which is actually the lowest in Lebanon, up to 1,200, which is up in the mountains that feed into the wadi. Temperature varies also from negative 5 degrees Celsius up to 37 and a half. But also it is uh, mainly agricultural rangeland is the, com the most common uh, uh, utilization. So, looking forward, we used crop work. It's a, it's a model developed uh, uh, to, to assess crop water consumption. You based on the FAO pending on teeth. We varied the scenarios. We looked at uh, increasing temperature from 0 0.5 degrees Celsius all the way up to 4. And then we varied the relative humidity by 5 degrees Celsius, increased it for the coastal basin, because that's what we expect to witness on the coast due to increased temperature and being close to a water source. We decreased it in the inland basin because of the decrease in uh, precipitation and water sources. And then we combined both in a third scenario. And, wow, this doesn't look so good. Anyway, ET increases with temperature. We were able to see that and the correlation was great. Uh, when we varied it with temperature, but when we varied, when we decreased, when we increased relative humidity, evapotranspiration decreased, and the combined ET, uh, uh, when we combined temperature with our relative humidity, we didn't have much of a change, so it was sort of mitigate, mitigated for us on the coast. And what we could see, what I want to take out of this is, if we look at the red line, if we look at the red line, here is the 1,000 millimeter uh, rainfall divide, and the average is of 800 when we look at it down here. Uh, grasses will start requiring, uh, will start needing water way before uh, the times that we are witnessing now. Now it's around, eight, uh, we, we, now it's around 1,000 millimeter. When we go down, the reduced to 800 millimeter, we will need to irrigate in July. And the same for uh, trees here, they will start being stressed more frequently and, the, and for olives for sure towards the end. So the same for when we did the same thing for Wadi Sharbin, we reduced relative humidity and we increased temperature and we saw that evapotranspiration increased and again, uh, the, the, the crops are already under stress uh, in, in, in our different months, and we see that being accentuated and uh, magnified. So this is what we have on evapotranspiration. So coupled with that, we looked at what changes do we expect with drought. And we, looked, we used the, the reconnaissance drought index, which is specific to the Mediterranean, and it's quite simple. We don't have a lot of data, and this doesn't require that much. It requires precipitation and temperature data. We had eight scenarios. We varied uh, precipitation degrees by 8% and evapotranspiration increased by 10%, and then we went through a whole series of scenarios. And we had to select a, a sample year, set of years to, to start out our model, which is 1983 to 1988, which is fairly and non -variable. And we started out with that, and we found out that the drought frequency increases. You can see it starts out with, if we use the, the data set 1993 to 98 as our uh, given, and then we, we, we put the variations in, we barely had any drought. But then when we reached a precipitation decrease of 30% and the evapotranspiration increase of 10%, we had one year in the, in the data set. And then when we varied it, precipitation decreased by 40%, which is quite uh, possible. And we increased the evapotranspiration by up to 20% all the years that we looked at, 1983 to 1998, they would have been drought years. So this is a significant part. So in, in summary, when we couple temperature increase with reduced rainfall, this would stress most plants in both basins towards the end of the dry season. In coastal areas, the relative humidity increase would mitigate some of the, of the increase in temperature. But in the inland area, the effect is double. Temperature increases would increase crop water demand by anywhere from 2 to 12% in both basins. And the decrease in relative humidity 
will increase the water demand by 7 to 14 percent. So additional demand on a, on a diminishing resource. Coupling relative humidity decrease with temperature uh, increase has the most detrimental impact on water demand, which makes it range, it ranges in between 12 percent and 50 percent. That's on the inland, this is where our supposed bread basket is. Precipitation decreases will lead over the next few decades to an increase in frequency of droughts. Typically, rule of thumb, rule of thumb, it's one in six years, one year of drought every six years we witness. It's going to change and the data shows it will, it will flip. So, as a, a set of final thoughts, we need to address water resources management with a clear accounting for climate change. We cannot ignore climate change. And in the new strategy, I think it's being done, at least. Uh, we, need, we need to look at agricultural water demand by varying irrigation techniques, breeding crops that are drought tolerant and temperature tolerant, develop cropping patterns that better utilize rainfall, more rain fed agriculture or supplemental irrigation or deficit irrigation, and look into uh, bringing produ into production areas in the mountains that are now and or have been neglected for the past decades. So these need to be brought back into production so that we compensate for the lack of rainfall in the car. Storage needs and capacity to mitigate effects of drought. We need to look at where we store our water and when. And to make sure that we address that properly. We don't have a drought management plan in Lebanon. Not, I don't think any country in the Middle East, Jordan was starting to work on one, but no country in the Middle East has a drought management plan. Syria suffered from that a couple of years ago. They had huge migrations. And then finally, we need to look at uh, developing crop, crops and cultural practices that are adapted to drought and heat through, through technology biotechnology. We are good at this. We have many, many facilities available to us. We need to approach that kind of uh, problem with science. With the science. Thank you. Search work, and we commend that effort, and we hope we will see more of that in a coordinated format. Allow me to introduce quickly, and we move quickly to the next session, not to uh, waste much time. So that's going to be the World Bank presentation of the actual flagship report. So I'd like to invite Mr. Ian Noble and Mrs. Dorothy. Certain just what was meant by adaptation, and I think we're still in that situation. 
Others felt that we had to keep a focus on mitigation no matter what, and that meant downplaying adaptation for a while. And others actually felt that talking about adaptation would be an admission or an open invitation to admit defeat in achieving mitigation. So there was a form of political antagonism uh, uh, towards it. Adaptation got various mentions in different uh, COPs. In the Zadeli Declaration, the Nairobi Work Program, the Bali Declaration, all pushing for more activity in the adaptation area. But it wasn't really until uh, the COP meeting in Poznan, which is really the lead up to Copenhagen, that a number of developing countries basically said, if you want us to take the mitigation efforts seriously, then you also have to think about our situation and take adaptation seriously. So I think it's true to say that in Poznan, in Copenhagen, and in Cancun, adaptation became a much more important political issue on that, that agenda. Now looking at the science and knowledge of adaptation over, over that time, often people dismissed the, the ability to deal with adaptation by simply saying there's still so much uncertainty. We're not certain what we're adapting to. When you can tell, give us better projections of climate change, then we can start thinking about adaptation. Some of us, and I was certainly one of these, I still do this, challenge them with, we know the world's going to be hotter, drier, and more variable. That is as much as you know about many other trends in society and our socioeconomic situation. And I often challenge people in a bet, but no one's taken up yet, and that is, I will make a projection of the world's average global temperature uh, in 2050 much closer than anyone else can do the global uh, oil price in 2050, and which of those matter most in our, our development prospects. I try to put the uncertainties associated with adaptation in the broader context of all of the uncertainties that policymakers deal with every day, and I think we have to go on doing that. In the scientific area, in the, in the policy area, the implementation and so on, there are a series of many people launched adaptation projects. They are excellent for learning and starting to understand what is required, but they are, that's what they're about. They're about learning, learning by doing. But we have to move on in, in more into the doing area, and that I think spots many organizations, both national, the UN, the, the multilateral development banks, etc., have been doing. They've been trying to use whatever phrase you like here, mainstream adaptation into development planning. I prefer the phrase climate resilient de development, or I prefer actually the phrase development that is climate resilient because it puts the, effort, the, the emphasis on development and climate resilience is a component, an important component of that. Another issue that was often raised is that we don't know what adaptation is going to cost, which, which is a sub-question. We don't quite know how to define adaptation yet either. Um, but it was quite clear that this was actually working against further advances in the adaptation area. We started to see estimates of the cost of mitigation, uh, both globally and also what it would cost to support developing countries in achieving uh, reasonable mitigation targets. The estimates of mitigation were in the hundred, or running in the tens, the hundreds of billions of dollars per year. And often the estimates for adaptation was, well, they're going to be trivial, they're going to be small, they're going to be tens of millions of dollars. Well, a few of us thought that was not the correct. We made a, sort of some ballpark estimates and said, the cost of adaptation are going to be the same order of magnitude, so take this ser seriously. And there's been quite a little cottage industry since then. You would have seen a number of different assessments. They vary on the cost of adaptation. They vary enormously. They vary a few tens of billions of dollars per year up into the hundreds of billions of dollars per year. Most of that variation comes about because they're estimating different things or different time frames. Some are estimating the near future, some are estimating 2030, some are 2050, but also some factored in um, what others would call development. Some included the so-called adaptation deficit. We all know, we've heard again here, that nowhere, nowhere in the world is fully adapted to the current climate. Should that be part of the cost of adaptation or included in the calculation like that? But I think now the message is out there, the cost of adaptation are significant. The question now is, how should we actually uh, raise those costs and who will and bear those costs? One of the most important things here is how do we engage the private sector? Because many of the costs are going to be borne by the private sector, not as you know, a perceived direct cost, but simply the private sector doing what it has to do. And that is look for opportunities, look for profits, and protect its assets. And that's where much of the expenditure on adaptation will, will, will come. But I think this is one of the most difficult challenges at the moment, is trying to define just what constitutes adaptation and uh, therefore, who should take responsibility? 
But the simple fact is we do need to support not just international institutions, not just national governments, not just even local governments, but also the private sector in understanding what we're being challenged by. Another issue out there that's uh, still not resolved, as we touched upon a couple of times here already, is the link with disaster risk management. Uh, there's obviously a link at the right at the moment, but we also know there, there is going to be residual damage due to climate change because we will not adapt completely to the impacts we're facing. Now moving on to the last element here, and that is the IPCC. As I said, I've been working in this, this area for more years than I, should, I can remember. Um, the IPCC has had a mixed approach to adaptation. Much of the adaptation is, is actually buried in Working Group 2 reports, which if you read the title, it's, um, not exactly myself, no, it includes impacts and adaptation. Usually the adaptation is an add-on add section at the bottom of the chapter, rather than a, a detailed um, ongoing discussion of, of what should be done. In the fifth assessment report, um, well, sorry, the, third, the fourth assessment report, there was a single chapter dealing with adaptation issues in, 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 in general. In the fifth assessment report, there will be four chapters dealing with this. Uh, I happen to <coughs> co-lead the, the, the first of these chapters, which will set the scene for the, the others. And one thing we'll be doing is trying to go beyond the simple list of problems and move much, much more to what are the first steps towards solutions. And that's a theme that we've tried to bring into this, this uh, flagship report here as well, is to move from listing the problems, we do that, we try to do that in a comprehensive way, but also move towards looking for those first steps. And in the breakout groups that we'll do later, we'll be trying to emphasise the same sort of points so we look forward to your inputs on those sorts of issues. So thank you, Dr. Mike. That's a good, good background. As we heard earlier, climate change is the development challenge of our time, globally, in the Arab world, and in Lebanon. Climate change is a threat to poverty reduction and economic growth. And if we're not careful, it might reverse many of the development gains that countries and communities have managed to make in the recent decades called for action. The World Bank in 2010 came out with a report where they gave us a message on action. It is we need to act now, we need to act together, and we need to act differently. This report is, with many other pieces of work that have been ongoing, one of the basis for the work that we are doing now and I'll be presenting to you. Also, Hafez here in Lebanon have done a fantastic piece that we also build on, on climate change. That report, I think it's two years ago, 2009, addressed both adaptation and mitigation. We think that adaptation is an urgent issue, as well as mitigation, but for the Arab countries right now, we think that adaptation needs to put on very squarely on the agenda. As Ian mentioned, the, for the private sector and for government and for communities in general. So therefore, we talked to the League of Arab States about potentially producing this report together. And it has been a great opportunity for us, particularly us that unfortunately don't have the privilege of living in the region, to have an institution that is based in the region and have so much experience and knowledge. This has led to this draft flagship report that you have seen mentioned in the green flyer that has been circulated, and I'll talk a little bit more in a minute. The agenda of this presentation are the following. First, I'll give you the objective and the outputs, the process and the scope, some preliminary findings, and I would like to illustrate they are preliminary findings, and particularly after the presentation we've seen this morning, I learned a lot and I want to thank you all because many of these things that you mentioned we will, would like to include with your permission in the final version of the report. And then I will mention briefly the next step. I think many of you in your presentation have also mentioned why this report is needed. The current climate projections, both the variability and the change, has shown us that many things are happening now. You have mentioned them in the previous discussions and presentations. And 
also the stresses. We heard also already that climate change is not the only factor that policymaker has to deal with and the only factor we have to take into account because as we heard there's population growth, the large urbanization in the region and the education in the Arab countries as just example. These two, the sort of stresses and the climate change that we are facing plus the projection leads to increased vulnerability for countries, for regions, for municipalities, for communities, and often for individual people. This call for climate change adaptation to reduce the negative impact and build resilience in government, communities, and in households. And this is the motivation for this report. The main output of the report is the flagship report that is mentioned in the flyer. Apart from that, we are also producing a documentary on climate change, and a lot of it will be on the impact and what is being done already, and adaptation option for the Arab countries. You might have seen our cameraman Baba walking around. He might come and approach you to ask you a few questions so we can get another take, because this is also an output for this task. Moreover, we are producing a climate change portal, and I'd like Ian to present the portal because you're the mastermind behind this where we would give you, everybody interested, easy access to country data on climate change and social economic data. Thanks, Dorit. Yeah, this came about because so often we found in talking to people in countries, we heard the refrain, we have no information, we don't know enough to move ahead. And that is often very true. But also, often people do not know, or do not know how to access the information that was out there. Now, I'm a you know, scientist working in the climate change area. I've been accessing this data for most of my life. I still have great difficulty in accessing some of the websites and data centers that are out there. And I understand that somebody who is expert in another area trying to draw upon this information is, is very, very difficult. So some of us in the bank decided to start developing a climate portal simply to help, to save our time actually in many ways, by bringing together important quality checked data in a way that people can simply access, we can look at it, and also download components of that into an Excel spreadsheet or something where they could use it further. When you open up the Climate Change Portal, and this is live, it's on the web at the moment, if you want to find it, the easiest thing to do is just type in World Bank Climate Portal, you will come up straight away. When you open it up, you actually see a map of the world. I've zoomed in already to, uh, to, to the Lebanon area. You can click on a site and get a very quick summary of some of the core climate-related uh, information for that site. It's a little bit hard for you to read there. Hard for me to read here too. Let me get my glasses. Um, still hard. Uh, you'll see that there are projections of climate change. There's historical data, historical climate data. Uh, there's data on variability. It takes you into the site maintained by Columbia University, which is very detailed, so it lets you come in there very quickly and simply. There is also impact data on impacts, socioeconomic data, and so on. It's trying to bring all that information together for you. You can plot various graphics and see how um, this is showing how precipitation has changed at that point. This is December precipitation since the beginning of the, the last century. We still found that many people said, this is good, but it's still not what I, I need. I need something where I, if I have to go and brief colleagues, my, my manager, or who it might be, or I'm about to go and work in a country, or I'm about to try to compare what my country is like compared with another country, I need something more accessible. So we've been developing what are called dashboards. Each dashboard refers to a particular country, and the dashboard is basically trying to summarize climate change in relation to other development issues. In particular, we're now linking together with the GD, GFDRR, the, the Global Facility and Disaster Risk Reduction, to make sure that we have disaster risk reduction and climate change linked together in this, this mode. I can show you here just this is Yemen, um, because it's the only country that's been done so far for this. But in fact, as part of this particular project, we will be doing all of the Arab region countries in the dashboard. They'll they be released by the time the report comes out. They're in, in production right now. Now, these are linked to the underlying databases, so they're live documents, even though you can also print them out as a PDF, you can look at them on the, on the web, however you want to. You can pick and choose what you want to display. But they are linked to the live data, so as the data is updated, these pages will update automatically. 
To start with, you see initially a, a brief description of Yemen. You can plot certain uh, major features like roads, rivers, water systems, and so on. You can go further in and ask for summaries of the climate at particular points. But you'll see that on this, over the left-hand side there, are, you can't read it probably, but there are summaries, brief summaries of what the rainfall is going to do at that point, what the temperature will do at that point. It's trying to provide that information in a readily, readily accessible form. You can go down further and ask for historical uh, maps. Um, and this, you get the, these maps showing you the, here the precipitation, maximum temperatures, minimum temperatures, etc., from the historical data. Um, I, sorry, I zoomed in there, but it's, it, it, it overloads the computer memory to do, to do that. You can also ask for projected information, all the various climate G GCMs that are out there, how they're working, what they, what they will, um, what they project, and, and so you can do that analysis. All of this can be graphed, printed, or downloaded to Excel files as well. Finally, we, we also look at the impacts and vulnerabilities. This actually just shows you some of the, all, the other vulnerabilities that matter. This one in particular is uh, number of children who are uh, effectively malnourished, uh, done as a spatial map. You can see plots over here, mortality rates, you can pick up those from the several hundred different variables there to see. And also we have a sheet on adaptation um, and some of the core issues, what are the core points in national communications, for example, um, and in the, I haven't gone into the disaster risk reduction, there are components on the same thing there. So that's what's in this dashboard. As I said, it's the third component of, the, of this whole process. There's a report, there's a film, which we'll talk, we'll talk about more later, and there is this, this database. And that's what we've been trying to work on. <coughs> I certainly appreciate you talking about this and giving us feedback. Thanks, Ian. So what we're doing in this report, we are producing the legal rap state. Ahmed Afed has been drafting the and leading the water chapter. He's now working with ESQA on another water task that is sort of, if you will, you can see as using this as base, and now they're going to dip much, much further. So if you want more information, just talk to, to, to ESQA about this. Then we also have Dr. Rima Habib, who leads the chapter on health and has done a fantastic job on that, and we will see some of, of her findings here in the presentation. We have Christina Kadis, who's worked with us in the World Bank, who is leading the urban chapter together with Dr. Amal from Jordan. And we have other people from Lebanon involved, as was mentioned before. We have two advisors from the institute here. We have Nadim and we have Khamer Khouri. We also have Nadim Saab from Afed as an advisor. And we have been, and we have another contributing author and advisor, Nadim from IFAD. Nohami from IFAD is sitting down there. Plus, I'd like to thank all the rest of you that I haven't mentioned for contributing. And I know Jacobo from the Italian Development Corporation was instrumental when I started to work in the region and gave me a real good in education on what are the issues, the problems, and how many institutions are trying to solve these problems. So these chapters we are preparing in a very participatory way. We're trying to get as many inputs from the region. We're trying to summarize the literature both in Arabic, French, and English, because that's one of the things we were hearing that IBC have a hard time with, that they mainly use the literature in English. And then we also try to identify the gaps and provide policy options for policymakers, the private sectors and others, and how to address and fill, how to address the, the issues and fill the gaps. We also put the zero drafts in March up on the internet and put it on Facebook and all the social networks in order to find talented young researchers that we haven't met, we haven't heard about, that might have really been, been discovered yes, yet, if you will. And we got a lot of young researchers that contacted us with information and wrote us pieces, and a number of these were invited to be part of the, of the last, team, last team, and we have learned a lot from them too. And as I mentioned, the Arab government has been invited to contribute, and again now on this 
consultation draft, we have asked them to assist. So, as I, as I briefly mentioned before, we have a number of lead authors leading these eight chapters. The first chapter is, if you will, a little bit on the methodology, where are we, why are we doing this, but then we also do some work on the economic impacts and poverty impacts in the Arab countries. Then on chapter two, where Ian Noble is leading, sorry, I forgot to mention this here. Ian is leading together with Jens Hesselberg Christensen for the Danish Meteorological Institute in Copenhagen, who is also the contributing and lead author of the IPC reports, chapter one. It's sort of looking at the climatology, what is out there, what do we know now? And then they're coming up with an amazing checklist for policymakers and people that manage large projects of how to go about start introducing adaptation into projects and into the, the government um, action in general. Then we have the chapter three where we look at water stress. We have chapter four and five we look at rural and urban issues such as livelihoods and in the rural chapter we look at agriculture and food security. Then we have chapter six is on gender and adaptation to a changing climate. And we have chapter seven, as I mentioned, on health. And finally, we have a chapter eight. When you go into the, our website, that hopefully will be up by the end of the day, where you can find the draft report, you would probably see that chapter eight is a little bit incomplete. And that's actually what we wanted to present. Because we don't want to write this chapter eight without getting input from you. So why are we here today? is to move a little bit further, as Ian also mentioned, away from just naming all the impacts and the consequences, but how do we address them? So we've been going around in different countries now in order to get this input from all the stakeholders and the people that are working on climate change and working in issues and areas that are related and are impacted by climate change, to hear from you how you suggest that we go about this. So now I'll go in and mention some of the preliminary findings that you'll find in the report. Of course, it's very summarized and doesn't do justice to any of the chapters, but it's sort of to give you a flavor and the main messages as they stand right now. They might change in the final report based on what we hear from you and from some of the participants in other countries and the comments that we will receive in the next couple of months. As we have heard in the previous presentations, it's getting warmer, drier, and more bearable. And climate change is happening now. In 2010, in the Arab world alone, it was the warmest years on record since the beginning of the 18th century for five countries in the region. And of the six countries that had the highest temperature in the world, five were in the Arab world. And Kuwait topped the list by measuring 52.6 degrees Celsius. The Arab Sea experienced the second strong tropical cycle on record last year. And it peaked at a category 4 in strength. Just in Oman alone, it killed 44 people and cost the economy something like $700 million. The coral reefs took its worst second beating because of the summer the record summer of ocean water temperature. And you know, in a region where many people make their living from tourism, when the coils are bleaching, and as some predictions say, will disappear in the next decades, that means a lot of people will lose their livelihoods. It's already is getting warmer, drier, and more variable. In recent decades, throughout the region, temperature have increased by 0.2 to 0.3 degrees Celsius per decade. We've seen more frequent intense heat waves and more, less but more intense rainfalls that have caused the frequency, increased frequency of drought that we've heard in the previous presentations and floods. And in, in Lebanon, as we have heard, Lebanon is projected to receive considerably less precipitation, mainly in the winter and in the spring. And the loss of winter precipitation is not good for the snowmass. 
neither in Iraq or in Lebanon, because it could potentially increase, increase summer droughts. The loss of winter snow also has an impact in tourism. If there's no snow, I have a hard time bringing my skis to Lebanon, and the people living in Beirut will face the same, the same thing. So the climate change really can affect tourism in a bigger way as we move forward. <coughs> the future will be warmer, drier, and more variable. Temperature is likely to raise 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 degrees centigrade per decade as we move forward. This is one and a half times faster than the global average. So the Middle East and North Africa are he heating up much faster than the rest of the world. Also, most of North Africa and Eastern Mediterranean will become drier. We have seen a significant decrease in the number of rainy days in Lebanon, and although that most countries are becoming drier in the region, a few countries may be facing an increase in rainfall, such as Sudan, Djibouti, and maybe Yemen. And we should not forget that this, this sounds potentially good and promising, particularly for agriculture in the, in the countries, but the problem is with a greater variability and more extremes, as we were hearing also before, it will come so fast that it might wash away the topsoil, etc. So moving into the long-term consequences of the sea level rise, even that we've heard before that in some countries you can notice it already now, we will face a situation in the far future, at the end of the century, with a one meter sea level rise affecting something like 3% of the population in the whole MENA region, which is three times more than the global population altogether. Climate change is already impacting people's lives and livelihoods. And we should not forget, it's hitting the poor people the hardest. Climate adaptation strategies that people have been using throughout history might no longer be available. Climate has been changing for thousands of years. You that live in the region and have studied the history of the region know better than anyone that some of the first records from about 4,000 years ago show, shows that there was a temporal climate shift that created 300 years of reduced rainfall and colder temperature in the North East Syrian, for example, that forced people to abandon the rain-fed fields up there. Now, as was also mentioned earlier, that North East Syria has in the recent years faced one of the most severe droughts, leading to people abandoning their livelihoods, have completely depleted their assets. Beforehand, maybe 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, People would take their livestock and move somewhere else where the grass is greener. Today, this is no longer possible, or it's increasingly difficult. People cannot go wherever they want because of borders, but also because of property rights and because of we are a large number of people everywhere. Meaning that the Bedouins, for example, in the northeast of Syria, have only one option, and that is to move to the urban areas. And in Syria, over the past five years, the numbers count about a million people out of 22 million that have moved to the cities, which have put extreme pressure on public services. And the poor Bedouins that have lost their livelihoods have a hard time to adapt in the urban settings because they don't have the skills that is necessarily required to make a good living and a life for their families. This little boy that you see on all the flyers, he is one of the people that we met when we went to northeast Syria. And he lives in a tent outside Palmyra. His family's stock of animals was depleted completely. More than 300 animals. They started off with about five years ago. And within three and a half years, they were down 
to zero and had to move. Poor people are the most vulnerable because they're highly dependent on natural resources such as the batteries for their livelihoods. Also, their poverty status and the level of education is important. And again, where they live, their geographic location also plays in and their migration status. And we should not forget that climate change is superimposed on all the existing vulnerabilities faced by the poor people in the Arab world as in the rest of the globe. The acid poor Bedouins that live in the arid area of the Arabian Peninsula have few resources and little capacity to adapt to the changing climate. Their, their limited capacity to cope with climate extreme render them extreme vulnerable to climate change. Climate change has large, short and long-term welfare reduction implications. For this task, we work with history and put together some calculation by using downscaled global climate models, crop models, global economic models and CGE modeling to address the impact of climate change in three countries. We did Syria, Yemen, and we're working on doing Tunisia. The large near and long-term welfare implication due to climate change, measured by household income, while allowing for people to continue to adapt. We know that people have been adapting for thousands of years, and they continue to the best of their knowledge. So assuming that they will continue, we find that by 2020, the how come Household income projected for Syria is projected to be reduced by half a billion dollars. In Yemen, something like 300 million. By 2050, household incomes are projected to increase something like 6 billion dollars in Yemen alone. The increase of frequency of droughts reduces GDP and food security. And also, using these CDE models and, and global models, etc., we found that an average an average drought reduced GDP by one percentage point compared to a non-drought year. Also, the food security worsened significantly during droughts, and the poor are hit the hardest because they lose this capital or deplete it, they reduce their income, and they face higher food prices. So, the poor farm households are the most affected, followed by other rural people and urban households. Poverty levels tend to increase in a drought year by up to 1.4 percentage point. Also, increased flux frequencies leads to income losses and more hunger. For example, in Yemen we find that the total income loss over the period 2008-2011 cost in terms of agriculture value added, something like 180 percent of pre-fraud agriculture value added. Also, the number of hungry people spiked by 15 percentage point. Climate change reduced the availability of already overexploited water resources in the Arab region, and we know. And I've heard from the previous presentation that water scarcity is a constraint to socioeconomic development in the countries. Today, there's already a 16% renewable water supply gap in the Arab world, which is met by overexploiting the renewable water sources, as we have previously heard too, depleting groundwater, and in some countries, they fill the gap by desalinizing water, seawater, at a high societal environmental cost. By 2050, the gap is no longer 16%. The calculation shows that it's likely it's going to be more like 50%. Hence, 50% 50 of the water needs in the region need to be imported, desalinized, or something like that. Lebanon has more water than most Arab countries. Therefore, Lebanon has also been more scrutinized than many countries. Lebanon has renewable water resources of more than a thousand cubic meters per capita. And they don't receive much water from outside the boundaries. However, as we have learned producing this study, the water quality can be an issue. 
Although Leon has a good amount of water compared to other countries in the region, water shortages are frequent in the coastal cities. And some people lacking access to water illegally sometimes tap into the shallow aquifer resulting in the salt water sea, the seawater intrusion that we heard in the previous presentation. Lebanon has more water than most Arab countries and is a source for supply of water for other countries. Therefore, the water management in Lebanon is being more scrutinized, being more looked at than in many other countries in the region. Climate change also affects agricultural production and food security. It's likely that the agricultural output could be reduced by up to 40% by 2080 due to the high dependence on climate sensitive agriculture in the Arab countries. 80% of the water in the region goes to agriculture. And increased water scarcity would require more efficient and less agricultural water consumption. Climate resilient production calls for climate resilient crops, climate resilient animals, trees, fish species, etc. And that includes both the drought and the salt tolerance. Species. Climate change stresses the local food production system and calls for increased import to bridge the demand. And we should not forget that the global food prices, especially the spike, will increase food access to all of our households. So, all in all, negative impact give negative impact on rural livelihoods and income in the Arab countries. Agriculture in Lebanon, agriculture in Lebanon would contribute slightly less to GDP than the average of the region. <coughs> the region average is about 12%. Also the farms, as we heard earlier, are rather small in Lebanon. They're 97% or up to 5 hectares and tend to use limited technology and low-skilled labor and therefore may also deliver relatively low yields, hence become even more um, affected by climate change than the bigger ones. Lebanon rely on cereal import and these prices are vulnerable and we do not forget that the both the supply and the price risk are important and therefore make Lebanon a little bit more vulnerable than other countries due to their fiscal situation. And I'm referring to the Gulf countries that doesn't have a fiscal problem. So we need to really look into agriculture as some of the work that we heard early on is taking place. Climate change is associated with rapid urbanization and people and assets settle in vulnerable areas. The Arab countries have a higher urbanization rate than the rest of the world. Although the Lebanon has a lower urbanization rate, but it has also to do with the fact that I believe that more than 85% of the Lebanese population live in the urban areas already. And the majority of the people in the urban centers they live along the 30,000 37,000 kilometer coast line of the Arab world. And it also lives, these people also live in low lying coastal zones. Many of the residents, and we heard numbers for 20, up to 20 to 40 percent of the urban dwellers actually live in slums or informal settlements, which makes them vulnerable. Both to the landslides we heard. We should not forget that many of the poor people also have their livelihoods come out of their home. So if their house, their dwelling is washed away because of a landslide, they wash away their assets, they wash away their house, including, and wash away potentially their livelihoods. In Latin America, we did, did, we did some work for another report where we found that 50% of the poor people's income are produced in their house. Hence, all in all, we want to emphasize that climate change vulnerability needs to be considered upfront when we make urban infrastructure decisions and investment. Both women and men are stakeholders in adaptation and important agents of change. 
Climate change impacts women and men differently. Traditional gender roles imply that, that women often are more vulnerable because they're so dependent on natural resources. Or they tend to manage the household natural resources. For example, in Yemen, already now, girls have been taken out of school to help their mothers fetch water. And since water is becoming more and more scarce, the travel times are increasingly, in, increasingly increasing. That's not good, but you got it. Meaning that the girls are not only having a hard time right now learning and accumulating the skills that is needing for them to have a productive life later on, but it might also impact the next generation as the mothers, we know from research, mother's education is super important for the education of the children, particularly the girls. This graph shows, I don't know how clearly you, you can see it, but it sort of shows women and men's engagement in agriculture throughout a number of the selected countries in the Arab world. And we see at the percentage of the economic <coughs> active population, women are more engaged in agriculture than men in all the countries that we show here. And we can see that for Lebanon, women are more engaged, but it's a much, much lower share of the population than in the other countries. So the bottom line is we should not forget that men, women and men are both needed in order to adapt, adapt effectively to climate change. And particularly the women need to be included in the decision making as they manage so many of the household and natural resources. Climate change are causing increased water and wet borne diseases. We have been seeing that dengue had been moving up in the Arabian Peninsula, Thais in Yemen had a large number of outbreaks last year, much many more than seen before, and we also see that waterborne diseases are increasing. And we should not forget that the more vulnerable again to climate change are the poor and the vulnerable. And those identified by Rima and her team are internally displaced people and those with low socioeconomic status, residents of low-lying area camps and slums, and those that work outdoors, particularly in construction. And I think all Rima's work show very, very clearly that particularly outdoor construction working in the Gulf will be having a difficult time moving ahead if temperatures continue to rise the way that we have seen and they continue working the way they are doing. And the chapter also alerts to that the healthcare system in most of the Arab countries currently are not able to provide wealth for the climate related health issues. And data is one of the things that are needed to improve this. So these are some of the main findings that we have in the report right now. And before I finish, I'd like to give you a snapshot of the timeline as we're moving forward and how we intend to go from here. So in January, here in Lebanon, we have the first drafting workshop where we identify the links between the, the, the topics. We develop annotated outline for the background papers. In March, the lead authors send us the zero draft that we put up on the internet for everybody to see. And then in June, we had the second writing workshop where these chapters were improved and we also came in and realized there was some gap of cross-cutting issues so we could create a submitted chapters, including on disaster risk management, ecosystem services, tourism. We have, have decided to do very, very recently because we feel that there's, there's so much that's going to happen in that sector with the changing climate. And then based on these well-informed, really good chapters that we received for example, go from, from Hamad and Rima, we produce this draft report that will be up on the internet today for you to, to see, comment on, and contribute to. So right now, we've gone to a few countries. We were in Jordan uh, yesterday, 
we were last week, I'm mean, losing a bit of track of time. Last week, we were in Cairo with the League of Arab State when we presented in the JCDAR meeting. We are going to Tunisia after here, where we will be in the African Development Bank having all the Arab African countries represented to have a consultation with them on the report. And finally, we end up in the Emirates at the end of next week. Also, with the governor of Lebanon, we are working on a side event for the COP17 in Durban, and we are really, really grateful for the invite from Minister of Environment to work with you on this. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to present some of all this great work that we have seen here today in the previous presentation, and give a broader audience a possibility of learning for what we are doing in this task in the region. Then we, in January, will have the third workshop where we will incorporate all the comments that we hopefully get from you and suggestions to make sure that there's nothing that we have received that is not work through discussed and the relevant and important comments will get a lot of attention in the space we're going into now. So in January, this was January, we finalized the report from January to the spring. We hope in April to launch both the report, the movie, and the portal. So now, it's really a call to you. And I mean, you, you, you. And I hope you will look at the report. I hope you will comment and send us pieces. If you're sitting with information or something that you think the report can benefit from, and policymakers, people working on climate change adaptation can benefit from, please let us have it. You will be acknowledged for this. You will be a contributing author to the report. And we are reaching out as nobody we want to exclude. So please pass this website around to your colleagues, to your friends, and people that you find could be interested in this. And the website is in the green flyer that was outside. If you haven't grabbed one already, it's in the bottom. So please send us your comments and suggestions for improvement. <coughs> but before I, I finish, I would like to find to thank the founders, the funders of this task. I'm super grateful to the Development Corporation of Italy, Giacomo and his team, to the European Union, IFAT. Without you, we couldn't have done this. With the League of Arab States, we couldn't have done this, and even from our colleagues from the World Bank that have <coughs> given us the fund, funding to do this and be here, we're very, very grateful. Thank you, everybody.